Welcome, everybody. It's good to see so many folks. Um, I'm Justin Piccarelli. I'm here to introduce Dr. Camilla Stivers, um, who was my dissertation chair. Um, and she actually you came out of retirement but stayed out of retirement to chair it, right? Is that fair? I don't, I don't want to list her CV, but um, she has worked at Evergreen State College um, and was, um, she had the Levin chair position at Cleveland State University um, for, for almost, what, 10 years? Five in the chair, but then a, an additional five on the fact. Okay, so um, I don't want to list her CV. I will say that I think you will find her um, to be extremely frank, open, and friendly all of which are good qualities that promote learning. Um, and while I was watching the election, uh, I was secretly rooting for, for Trump to win because I wanted there to be more attendees here <laughs> um, to welcome her. Um, and maybe that helped, I, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so I will say that you can expect um, her ideas to, to kind of deeply resonate within you. Um, and, and if, you, if they don't, you can blame me, seriously. Um, so without further delay, uh, please give her, uh, Dr. Stivers, a warm welcome. Thank you, Justin. I have to say, working with Justin was more fun than, uh, you know, it was worth coming out of whatever retirement I was in. I feel like I've just sort of ratcheted down rather than, you know, there being a big, divide between yes and no, except for the money. The money stops, but other than that, yeah. I mean, you start collecting that stuff you've been saving all those years, but, uh, but you know, I never did it for the money anyway. I think most of what I did, I mean, I had to eat and you know, you have to think about that. Um, okay, uh, it's great to be here in Wyoming. I have to say that I was, uh, born and raised and lived most of the most of my maybe almost the first half of my life in the east and um, the first time I drove west which was in 1974 we went up into the bighorns and that was the first time I'd ever been in big mountains and I was hooked <laughs> I just, I mean, I thought I was in paradise, and uh, I think there's still less a little bit of me up there near Bucking Mule Falls, so, um, so it's, and I've been back a number of times since then, mostly to go up in the mountains, various ones, but anyway, it's great to be here. I want to uh, start with a bit of a disclaimer, which is that I don't intend to try to interpret what happened a week ago. <laughs> if you want to talk about it when we get to the discussion, that's fine. I'm happy to hear wisdom from somewhere. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's too soon for me to try to pontificate uh, to the extent that I ever do that uh, about, what, about the election. So, okay, the question we're going to think about for the next little while is, having to do with public service. And within the particular venue of public service, why can't a woman be less like a man? Um, and, and what I'm gonna try to tease out is how gender assumptions that we all carry around with us, every society that we know of has fairly um, firm ideas about what men are supposed to be like, how they're supposed to behave, and what women are you know, like, what the, how, what, how they're supposed to behave. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is they differ <laughs> from society to society. There, Margaret Mead once wrote about, you know, sex and temperament in three primitive societies. One of the societies she studied, the, men, the women were, you know, striding around, competing with each other, and the men were sitting under the trees trying on makeup and jewelry. 
really. So, you know, but we all have these ideas. And so what I want to tease out a little bit is what does this have to do with public service and, and women's opportunities and progress into public service. And so we're going to consider things like the stereotypes that we all, the con, sort of conventional understandings that we have about what it means to be a manager, what it means to be a leader, and of course, what do we mean by public? Because since, at least since ancient Greece, which is now what, 4,000 years ago? Um, 3,000? Um, the public space has been defined on the exclusion of women. Mm -hmm. That was one of the constitutive features of public space, was that women were not there. So, you know, that's a little bit of a hurdle for us to, uh, <laughs> to uh, overcome. So that's, that's basically what I'm going to try to uh, say some things about. Now, I want to start with um, turning the question around because it may sound vaguely familiar to you. I got it by, from the old um, Broadway musical from, oh, long ago now. Uh, most of you probably weren't born. 1960, a um, Broadway musical called My Fair Lady, which was a story about, uh, it was from the Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion play about this professor who decides he's going to turn this kind of rough-hewn, uh, cockney young woman into a very refined, posh lady. And he soon realizes he's bitten off a whole lot more than he was <laughs> prepared to choose. And at one point in the play, he sings or speaks against a background of music uh, a song called, Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man? And I'm just going to give you a tiny little snippet from that. He says, why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so honest, so thoroughly square eternally noble, historically fair, who, when you win, will always give your back a pat. Why can't a woman be like that? And he goes on and on and on at some length and ends up with, and what I really mean is, why can't a woman be like me? Well, okay, I've got an answer for you. <laughs> it comes not from me, but from Margaret Thatcher who was fondly known as the Iron Lady. Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister of Great Britain back in the era when Reagan was the head of state in the United States, and they actually really liked each other because they both wanted to do the same thing, you know, boil government down to its very most minimal level. But um, I remember in the early 90s reading in the local paper a quote from Margaret Thatcher, and here's the quote. The characteristics that they criticize you for, that you are strong-minded, that you make firm and tough decisions, are also characteristics which, if you were a man, they would praise you for. I think they haven't come to terms with that yet. Now, when I read that, I thought, Margaret is going to step down because she had built her whole career on trying to totally ignore and get everybody else to totally ignore the fact that she was a woman. Um, it, it wasn't a big success because, <laughs> well, we're going to talk some about why it was a, not a big success, but her, I, I read somewhere that her colleagues referred to her as everyone's mother in a bad temper. <laughs> so, okay, it, but she had the stereotype right, you know. You expect a leader to be tough, to be bold, to make uh, firm decisions, you know, when you step up to the plate and make the decision that nobody else is ready to make, and so on. And now I want to say, if men don't conform to that, they don't fare well either. Um, and, and so it's not just women who are affected by, st uh, you know, conventional understandings about gender. 
But the problem is that women are criticized for both. We're criticized when we don't conform to the model of what a leader is supposed to be, but we also get criticized when we do. So um, it, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't dilemma that we find ourselves in. So why can't a woman be less like a man? Let's talk about that. Does anybody remember Pat Schroeder, who was uh, from uh, Colorado, ran for Congress, was in Congress I think about 25 years, very, very uh, successful member of Con Congress, very influential, very well respected. When she was running for the first time, somebody, probably some reporter, said to her, are you running as a woman? <laughs> and she said, I didn't know I had a choice. <laughs> so um, now somewhere, supposedly, there's neutral ground. You know, there's supposed to be some, you know, I don't know, utopia or something where we don't, you know, where we can relate to each other without factoring gender into account. Um, I found an interesting example of that in the New York Times um, letters section just a couple days after the recent election. Um, this is a, a letter from someone who says that she is a white, middle-aged, college-educated college woman. Uh, she graduated from a Seven Sisters College. Um, and she says, you know, by all those indicators, I should have been in the Hillary camp, but I was not. Now here's what she says. Like a good feminist, I was gender blind when I considered the qualifications of the major party candidates. In fact, voting for Mrs. Clinton because she is a woman is the least feminist thing I could have done. We call that sexism. So she says she didn't vote for Trump either, she voted for a third party candidate. But that letter kind of brought me up short because I thought, well first thing I thought was, that's an unusual kind of feminist, but, but you know, uh, I'll, I'll take it if she wants to call herself a feminist, you know, because so many women <laughs> are not willing to, to um, adopt that, that term. Um, and I've, I'm on record as saying feminism is not just one thing, it's a lot of different things, and that's great, that's fine. So, but, but the idea that, um, that you can be gender blind when you're considering candidates for office seems uh, a little phony to me. I mean, maybe that's not the right word, but I, I'm just asking myself, how is that possible when, what's the first thing, when you know somebody you know has a baby or has a family member that has a baby, what's the very first question you ask? Well, it might be, or is everybody okay? Is the mother okay? Is the baby okay? But then the next question is gonna be, is it a boy or a girl? Somehow we think that's important. <laughs> and we actually spend a lot of our cultural and social uh, resources maintaining the difference, you know, <laughs> underscoring the difference. Um, so maybe the real issue is not looking for a way to be gender blind. Maybe the real issue is there are differences. What difference should the differences make? What, what, what's significant about the difference and what implications are there? Um, so let me back up a, a bit. Do a little bit of a reality check. I don't have a research assistant anymore, so I was unable to tease out all of the ins and outs of the election returns, but I think it's, it, it's not too far from the truth to say that Congress is still, Congress as a whole, both houses, is still less than 20% women. The Senate, I think I did figure out, Barbara Mikulski, where there were 20 senators, Barbara Mikulski retired and she was replaced by a man. But three women senators were elected and so I think that puts us up to 22, okay? That's about the pace that we can expect. Maybe one or two more um, every election cycle. 
Um, in the state legislatures, if you um, don't consider D.C. a state, which I think D.C. does, but most everybody else <laughs> is still having a little trouble with it, they're way up there, 46 percent of their legislature. But Colorado is next at 42 percent. Now, does anybody know what the lowest one is? Okay. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, there are five women governors out of 50. Um, out of the 100 largest cities, 17 uh, mayors out of the 100 are women. Now, you know, clearly we've, progress has been made over the uh, last 100 years, but the Center for American Progress says on their website that at this rate they expect parity between women and men in the, in the political realm uh, to be achieved in 2085. <laughs> So, you know, few of us might be still around, but not many. Certainly I will not be. Okay, so again, obviously things have changed and we have made progress over the last hundred years since the first woman was elected to Congress. That was Jeanette Rankin. Um, and she was elected in 1916, took her seat in 1917, served one term, and then she was out of Congress for several decades and came back in for one more term in the, in the 40s. She is the only person to vote against both world wars. Mm -hmm. Now, World War I, there were, she was not alone. There were about 20 or so uh, legislators who voted against World War I. She was alone. When she voted against World War II, she was a very committed pacifist. And, you know, I, I don't know whether I agree with that or not, but I do give her a ton of props for courage to be willing to stand up and all by herself and the only woman, not just the only one to vote, and, <laughs> but the only woman. Okay, she was also a suffragist. And I literally never vote without thinking of the women who chained themselves to the White House fence and were force fed and jailed so that I could do that. So, you know, history has a pull on me. I hope it does on you all too. Okay, so the other thing that was unusual about Jeanette Rankin was that she graduated from the University of Montana in 1902. She got a BA. That was pretty uncommon in 1902. But there were some college educated women. There were some college, uh, you know, women's colleges being established and there were women in small numbers entering universities. Um, they then had to face the problem of, well, what can I do now that I couldn't do without a BA? Because there was almost nothing. So I'm gonna come back to that. Let's go back for a minute. I'm gonna do some history because I think it's, it's important to know how we got to where we are. When the country was founded, in the early days, women and men, most families uh, worked around the house, I mean, around the home. You know, either they were farmers or they were both uh, crafts people of some kind. And a lot of the work, a lot of what was called work was done inside or right around the home. Um, in, in those early days, uh, an ideology developed around the idea of what was called Republican motherhood. It's Republican with a small r. Mothers of the Republic. Um, and and it, it had been considered, you know, that should women be involved? I mean, should they be given the vote right at the beginning? And the founding fathers, you know, Jay, uh, uh, what's her name, Adams, John Adams' wife, Abigail. Abigail, wrote to her husband and said, remember the ladies, because if you don't remember us, we are not going to promise to obey by everything you guys set up. She said it much more elegantly, but that was the, the thrust of what she said. But it was not to be. And the one or two states that had given women the franchise, like New Jersey was one, took it away. 
And uh, so, you know, the public space was a male space. In the early days, it was an elite male space. You had to be a property owner. Gradually, the franchise was extended. By the time of Andrew Jackson, pretty much all white men could vote. Of course, it took non-white people of both sexes a lot longer. Um, but the idea of Republican motherhood grew up because it it was supposed to make women feel like they were doing something to advance the public good. And, um, and it did make a lot of women feel that, and it made a lot of men feel better too, the few that might have felt kind of guilty about keeping their women out. Um, but the point of Republican motherhood was that women would encourage, would foster public spiritedness in their husbands and their sons. You know, would have them, um, would bring the sons up to be good citizens, to care about the public good. Um, what this did, though, in addition to making, maybe making women feel better, was it began to bifurcate um, gender roles. Um, that plus the industrialization of the country, which took men out of the home and into industry. Of course, it took a lot of women, too. We're talking about an ideology that was crafted at a kind of the higher echelons of society, and they hoped it would sort of trickle down to um, working class people and so on. Um, but it had, a, it had an impact, even though it was, it was class, shaped by class. But by having Republican motherhood, then that kind of frees men up to be um, no better than they should be in order to be successful in politics. And the politics came to be seen as, you know, not a pure thing. I mean, we still think that. We don't see politics as pure. It's deal cutting. You know, it's mutual back scratching. It's you do me a favor and I'll do your one. Let's make a deal. Who's been saying that recently? Um, uh, you know, and, and there, it was very raucous. There would be these open air rallies and guys would get out and, you know, have torch lit parades and, and all kinds of rhetoric of warfare and competition and so forth. A lot of polling places were taverns where um, any respectable woman was not supposed to go. Okay, so um, even though it was a class-based thing, it was its influence was quite pervasive on on general ways of thinking. Now, um, industrialization and urbanization, of course, also produced a lot of negative side effects, particularly in cities, as more and more immigrants came to our shores and flooded into cities to get factory jobs and um, work in sweatshops and so on. And uh, the well-to-do women in those cities decided that they just could not sit home any longer, that there had to be more role for women in public space than uh, that you know, than just raising your sons to be good citizens. And so they began to get out of the house and go and do charitable work. Um, first things like um, starting orphanages or, you know, helping widows who were uh, uh, destitute and so <laughs> forth. Um, doing what, the, what was called friendly visiting, which was the, early germ of so what became social work. Uh, it was very patronizing, but you know, probably some people got some food that they wouldn't have gotten. They would take baskets of food and go into poor neighborhoods and knock on doors and say, you know, can I help you? Do you want some food? And furthermore, I've got some good advice about how you should raise your kids. Uh, <laughs> because I know. Uh, so that began to, you know, that started to destabilize this divide where women were only in the home and men were only outside the, I mean, were the only ones allowed to go outside the home. 
Eventually, a um, decade or so before the Civil War, a few women were hired to work in the post office as copyists. One of them was Clara Barton, who later became the founder of the American Red Cross. Um, but when the Civil War hit, then that was a big, big impact because lots of men went off to fight. And who's going to do the work in the government? So they started hiring women, um, particularly in the Treasury Department, to clip and count currency. And they were paid half the salary of the lowest paid male clerk. Um, now, but their presence itself was a huge change and it was justified of course as necessary to the war effort which happened again when the Second World War came along. A lot of women went to work in factories because they were needed. Um, but the most interesting thing to me about what happened with that is that for the first time we had men and women occupying the same workspace outside the home. We had them, uh, you know, side by side in, in offices. And there were all kinds of things that had to be worked out, like, we're, well, we're going to keep the spittoons in here, and, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was quite a thing to figure out what was the etiquette, what was, how was this going to play out. And what it do, did was begin to exert real pressure on the notion that women had to be over here inside the house and men could be over here. Um, so out of the charity movement and out of the beginning destabilization of this, of these so, so separate spheres came the settlement movement where women, and here we go back to the college educated women who came out, that, what am I gonna do with my life? I mean, they actually wrote things like, how can I lead a life of significance? How can I make my life matter? And, and so they began, they heard about the movement in England where it started and decided that they were going to make it an American thing as well. And so, and now they, they were not all women, they were men who, who went and started settlement houses too. But um, the earliest pioneers, as far as I know, were women and uh, certainly the more famous, the people that became famous, like Jane Addams, um, were, the, were um, uh, in the forefront of the movement. Now, what their argument was, and it's an argument that is still being made. I mean, it's an issue that's still, it's not a dead issue is what I want to say. They said, uh, charity is not enough to solve or to even ameliorate the social problems that we're facing now. We have millions of people who are hurting and charity you know, good as it is, it cannot cope with the, the, the dimensions of this crisis. And, and so w one of their key, the settlement leader's key intentions was to try out what we would call today pilot programs. Um, <clears throat> test out the offering of some new service and then when it showed that it worked, then they would uh, advocate for governments to take, city governments, this is we're talking now, to take over these services. And in that, they were very successful. Um, they um, started the first kindergartens, the first public playgrounds, uh, the first well baby clinics, um, the first juvenile justice system was started by settlement house women, women from Hull House in Chicago, um, who somehow found out, probably from their work with families in the neighborhood where they were living, because the settlement women lived in the neighborhood, in the settlement house, that kids were being locked up with um, adult, some of them pretty bad folks, you know, not somebody you'd want your kid locked up with. 
And so several of them went to a judge in Chicago, somebody who was in a position to do something about it, and said, we want to start a juvenile justice program where we'll take the kids and we'll work with them and maybe they won't have to go, you know, they won't have to be locked up. That came from the settlement women. And they, and the judge said yes, and, and they went and raised the money to pay the salaries of the first women who were the first probation officers in Chicago. Okay, so they did a lot of stuff like that. They also uh, advocated very uh, strongly and publicly uh, for uh, to reduce the amount of child labor that was going on at that time and and to improve factory conditions for everybody who worked in factories um, so um, the justification was they called themselves municipal housekeepers. There were a bunch of women who were, most of them women, well, I would have to say all of the women who lived at the settlement houses were not married. Some of them were widowed, some of them were divorced, a, a couple, one, a couple of, of the better known ones actually. But there were a lot of married women who wanted to get in on this uh, movement now, you know, of municipal housekeeping. So they started women's clubs and they would do things like put um, drinking fountains in schools. <laughs> there never used to be drink, drinking fountains. Um, they did a lot of beautification stuff, which really, you know, is not something that should be laughed at, although it was probably not the most serious problem that people face. They, ha they did a lot of work on um, garbage and, and uh, how to get garbage collected more regularly and more effectively so that it, half of it wasn't left lying on the streets and what to do with it after it was collected. Uh, should it be incinerated? Should it be buried somewhere, et cetera? They were, so women were in the forefront of all these kinds of municipal um, issues. Now, so at the same time, there were a number of men who were also uh, working to reform city governments. Now, out of it, and they had a kind of a different take on it. They were interested in cost cutting, in saving money, in rationalizing the delivery of services, and so on. There were two philosophies that grew up side by side. The, 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 and this is, I mean, you can read this. It's very clearly articulated. The men said, going from the reality that cities are corporations, the city is a corporation, therefore the city is a business and it should be run like a business. And the women were saying, but wait a minute, the city is a home for its people and so it ought to be made more homelike. And, and you know, so we still sort of have those two philosophies in our in our public discourse I would say that um, the women's work represented the expansion of domestic values of values of the home into public space which is a fa fairly controversial um, thing still uh, because of the fact that we don't want government invading our private homes um, so we we want that that there want, we want there to be a line. Most of us do anyway. Um, but I do think that the women's, I think we have two different notions of service here. If we're talking about women in public service, I think we have two different notions of service. And the service that the women represented is, it, you know, it had it offered and, and did by going and being neighbors with the people they were trying to help was a kind of, you know, caring uh, neighborliness that, I mean, to them that was what public service was. It was going out there physically yourself and getting to know the people, not reading about it in a book, but getting to know the people that you were trying to help, understanding the problems from their point of view because they lived it every day. And the men's was, you know, more abstract. 
more an effort to be scientific. Now, neither one of them believed that they had the final, that, it, that, uh, that either philosophy was enough by itself. But I think the women did try to make a real effort to be as efficient <laughs> and as cost conscious as they possibly could in the, in the, in the work that they did. Um, they, I, Jane Addams once said that, that settlement work was learning to say we. And I, that really grabs me, you know, the idea that there's something about being in public that's not isolated individuals competing with each other for goodies mm -hmm. or for attention. It's some kind of coming together so, you know, out of common humanity that I think they were, they were working off of. Um, now, this whole thing was a politics, the, what the women did. The way they wormed their way into public space was to say, we're different and you need our difference. You can't deal with the problems that governments face without our, what we have to offer and we're different. Now, when the 19th Amendment was passed, it, it, they lost their momentum, as Hillary said the other night. They lost their momentum. All of a sudden, it was, you couldn't be different anymore because you were formally equal. Now, you have the vote and I have the vote. So what difference does the difference, it doesn't make any, the difference is, the argument is out the window because we're all, I have the same vote you do, so you should be able to get out of whatever you want, out of government. Um, so, uh, you know, caring kind of began to weaken the whole argument about being caring and being a neighbor and all of that. Um, and now you, you had to be an expert. Um, so it was impossible to be equal and different at the same time. That's still women's dilemma. That's still at the heart of what we face in public space, is how can we be who we believe ourselves to be? How can we bring the differing gifts that we offer into public space and not feel like we're um, invaders or foreigners who really shouldn't be there? And you know, we're told that fairly often. Okay, so the way this plays out today, I think is seen in the dilemma that women face of trying to walk a tightrope between being too masculine, which is no good, too feminine, no good either, and so somehow there must be this balance that we can strike, and we think about it like what we, how we dress and how we talk and our tone of voice and all the, and the language that we use and so forth. We're always struggling for some kind of middle ground. Um, and uh, so, but yet, you know, it's impossible not to be seen as women. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't help it, we are. So, but then we, if we, if we mention it, then we're playing the women card, see? And so that's the dilemma. I remember one thing I read years ago, I think it was in Fortune magazine, so it was probably some woman that was in a corporation rather than in government. But she said, somebody asked her what it's like to be doing the job she was doing, and she said, well, you have to look like a lady, act like a man, and work like a dog. <laughs> and that's still sort of true. Now, I want to say one other thing, and then I'm going to uh, uh, open it up. Um, I think the, the, another issue that I haven't had time to really talk about, but that is still big, is this structural divide between the public sector and the home, um, such that um, Employers try to pretend that somehow the work of survival um, is being done by somebody else. 
<laughs> besides their employees. You know, society could not survive if people didn't get together, have children, and raise them. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, everything would grind to a halt, totally. And yet, most employers are still very resistant to the idea that they have to have flexibility built into their personnel policies so that this work gets done. Who do they think is doing it? <laughs> well, we know who's doing it, don't we? I mean, you know, I have to say that men have come a long way on this, but they still feel like they're helping. You know, and when it comes right down to it, we're the ones that have to think about, okay, now let's see, what has to happen this week? So-and-so's got to get to the dentist. So-and-so has a flute lesson. So-and-so, you know, I've got to go to school and talk to the teacher because he got in trouble, blah, blah, blah. I, somebody has to pick up the dry cleaning. Somebody has to get the groceries and then assign the tasks. And men have gotten really good at saying, oh, I'll do anything, just tell me what to do, honey, I'll do it. Okay, but that still leaves women with, you know, a disproportionate burden, which means that they are sort of having two minds at once. You know, they're trying to play out how they're going to do the work that their employer expects them to do, and they're also sort of thinking, but if I do that, you know, I can't go out of town on the drop of a hat. My boss wants me to go to Pittsburgh next week. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I mean, all of this is still there even though progress has been made. So, so that's why a woman can't be less like a man. <laughs> until, until we get more equity in the household, you know, and I remember years ago, um, uh, I was not married to this person, but I had lived with him for a long time, and the, sen and the census guy came, and he said, who's the head of household? And we said, we don't have one. And he about had a fit. You can't not have a head of household. Well, maybe someday we'll have households where we really don't have a head. Um, I will say one other thing, and that is, and th I hope this doesn't get me in a world of trouble, but um, I do think that one of the things that is going to destabilize these gender divides that we have is trans. Because I think transgender people, now that they are becoming more and more visible and more and more vocal, that represents um, a real destabilization of our effort to put people in dichotomous boxes. Now, it's been there for a long time. You know, for years, hospitals had teams of doctors that when a baby was born with anomalous genitals, they would get together and decide, was this going to be a boy or a girl? Um, so, you know, the world's never been in this neat sort of dichotomy that we like to think it is, but it, now it's becoming very, very visible. And, uh, and I think that's great because I, I'm looking forward to what somebody called gender anarchy. I, I think that's just, you know, that's really going to get us somewhere. Okay, I'll take your, let's open it up and see what's on your mind. Yes? I am going to provoke you by saying, seriously, do you think that single women who do not have children are less boxed in by gender expectations than married women with children? No. At work? I don't think so. No. And, and so recreating the equity in home life is not actually addressing the gender norms of work in, in work environments necessarily. I mean, it may be one important part of it, but it's only part of it. I, I take your point. I think that's why the policies are in place th that are in place is not because of single women, but a because of married people, that they, they want to fend off the requests from married people, both women and men, for flexibility, because it's going to cost them five cents. But you're, you're quite right. I mean, a lot of people don't fit in, and never did, never will fit in these uh, dichotomies that, that we carry around. Yes? Last couple elections. Going back to women in politics, uh, Clinton ran against Obama uh, and lost. I was talking to Elsa, my parents were the nicest racists you'll ever meet. Um, that my dad would vote for a black man before he would vote for a woman. 
And I was thinking back to the Grimsky sisters, uh, yes. pre, who were abolitionists and who uh, had the audacity to speak in public because we weren't supposed to do that. Yes. And I also thought it was a bit ironic that Obama, got, as a black man, got to be president or a woman would, just as black men got the vote for him. Yes, when I used to talk about this uh, topic back in the 90s, um, I used to have students particularly say, do you think a black man will get elected or a white woman, f or a woman of any color first? And I always said, it'll be a black man. Uh, because, I, I mean, I, I don't know, because, because, but um, one thing that occurs to me is that, and I might get myself in trouble on this, but I think that race is not nearly, if it is structural at all, it's not nearly as structural as the fact that we, the human race has two sexes, okay? Black, uh, black, white, brown, red, that could disappear in a generation if everybody started intermarrying. I mean, really, it could. It's so, I mean, it's, it makes it even more hard, it, it makes it even harder to account for the strength of people's feelings, which we've seen during this horrible electoral season, uh, that seems to put so much weight on what color people's skin is. And, and I mean, that's just the surface, for God's sake. And it, it literally could disappear in a generation. But there have to be two sexes, I think. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you know, unless we get some breakthrough. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't particularly want the two sexes to go away. You know, I, I, I like men. <laughs> I like their difference. For me, you know, I like their the strengths that they have, the talents they have, the the way they have of talking, all of that, you know. I love that. Very hard right, going back to the beginning. Public spaces are male spaces. Private spaces are women's spaces. And even though we've been making strides, that idea that women could oust men from the last bastion of their privileged space is not well, I think that was actually at play uh, for a lot of people during the election um, because there was a political f philosopher years ago um, who, I'm blocking on her name, she was a woman, but she said, in the history of America, men have always defined their citizenship by their, the fact that they did work for pay, even though you know, really it's supposed to be about voting and what have you, but they have never felt like citizens. And they used to make this very explicit when they would say, well, we may be not very well off, but we aren't slaves, you see. So that set them apart and made them feel like at least somebody was worse off than they were. And I think that women played into that. At least we're not women, you know. Oh, God forbid. Um, because we're supposed to be the heads of the family. We're supposed to be the ones that are in charge. Um, so, yeah. Judith Clark. Yes. Judith Clark? Yes, yes, it was. Right. In that little book on citizenship. Yes. Um, on the way over here, I heard that Gwen died today. Um, so no! A friend mentioned, oh, you know, I thought she was she was good. I didn't think she was great. And I, and I, and I, I was startled, and I didn't, I didn't have a response right there. But as I drove here, NPR said she was known for bringing guests on to the news hour and making them feel like they were at a dinner party. And I thought, oh, well, that's why my male friend said she was good, but she wasn't great. Because he doesn't want to be at a dinner party while watching the news, and I do. Yeah. <laughs> right? so yeah his idea of greatness is that she puts them on the spot. She skewers them so they don't have any comeback. <laughs> so I just wonder, like, why can't there be a range of styles that people accept well, great? Well, exactly. I don't think there's a coherent answer to that. Why not? But I do think we're starting to make progress. I mean, at least there are women on television, 
you know, there are women commentators more and more, um, and, and there are women in all kinds of jobs that there didn't used to be. Uh, I just am kind of sorry that I'm not going to live to 2086 or whatever the Center for American <laughs> Progress said is going to get us to equity. Yes, so one comment. I think the role of president is because you don't elect a president, you elect a commander in chief. And that's a different role than the head of state. So I, I, that's the way I think about the U.S. vis a vis other societies. Well, that's correct or not, that's one way to say it. But my question is I said you would differentiate between leaders and managers, yeah. and, I would, and maybe facilitators. I would like to hear oh, your differentiation okay. across leaders, really managers, and I'm writing a book right now about the relationship between managers and workers, so, and I'm pretty down on managers because <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to raise workers up, you know, because I think they know stuff that, that managers don't know and that uh, all kinds of organizations would work better if managers would just kind of get out of the way. Uh, you know, assign people and then just say, go do it. You know, if you get in trouble, come to see me and we'll figure it out together. Um, but, you know, managers, I think, are rationalizers. They're supposed to make everything sort of organized and, and make sure that the goals are, are met, the, the working goals, the, organ, the, the objectives, the yearly objectives and so forth. Leaders, I have written, I think that first thing I said was leaders are the phlogiston of organizations. You know what phlogiston is? It's the stuff back before they discovered oxygen that it was um, uh, hypothesized that everything that burned had phlogiston in it. And, uh, and, and that was why it burned because nobody knew anything about oxygen. And that's what I think, you know, leadership is kind of the phlogiston. That it's that magic ingredient that we uh, look to to uh, produce um, an organization that flourishes and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's been a ton, mountains of research on leadership. And the only thing, I mean, it all boils down to, well, it's situational. Well, <laughs> what to me that means is that anybody could be a leader in the right circumstances. And I think leadership is a function of hierarchy. And because most of our organizations are pyramids of one steepness or another, it's the person at the top that we look to when the thing go awry. Okay, well, it's time for the leader to get us out of this or, you know, keep us from going out of business or find the resources or find the new clients or, and inspire us. That's the other thing that leaders are supposed to do. They're supposed to inspire us, to tell us what it all means. Why are we spending our lives doing this? Is it worth it? <laughs> leaders are supposed to tell us that. So, so I think the managers are kind of the technicians uh, of organization. They don't actually do the hands-on work that gets the results that we're all being measured. Uh, uh, for, you know, the performance measurement that is so ubiquitous now. Um, yes? Leaders in our society are picked by other people who've been leaders. And they were picked because they kissed somebody's ass or they knew somebody or something else. That's how they became leaders and that's why I think you have generals that are removed because they were totally incapable of, of doing the job. And yet here are these college kids that come off the farms, like Murphy, and ends up a, 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 an officer yeah, well, with, yeah. with, with the commission. And there are a lot of, a lot of incidents like that. So I think it's, leadership is really a crapshoot, just like everything else. Well, you know, I think leadership comes out of the circumstances of real leadership, if there is such a thing. And I'm, you could argue me out of believing that there is. But let's say for the moment that, that there is. I think it comes out of the moment, out of the circumstances. And I think there have been a lot of leaders like the guys you talked about who came off the farms, were handed a gun, and had to go into combat. And some of them became incredible leaders and inspired the other guys in their unit and, and did amazing things and, and are remembered 
by the guys that were around them and will be as long as any of them are alive. And I do agree with you, a lot of the people that end up in leadership positions end up not because um, they're so much better you know, at it, then some random person you could pick off the street and say, oh yeah, you're gonna be the leader now. Um, but I do think that there are, you know, one of my very favorite books on leadership is John Keegan's The Mask of Command. It's a wonderful book and in it he takes four men who've been the leaders of armies and, and sort of says what kind of image did they present because his whole thesis is that you can't be out there with all your, you know, foils and fo foibles and flaws. You have to construct an image that people will follow. And one of my favorite generals is Grant, Ulysses Grant, and there's a wonderful chapter in Keegan's book on Ulysses Grant as the, as the democratic leader. So, I mean, I, I think we can learn a lot from people who have been leaders, but I totally agree with you that a lot of them don't deserve Deserve the name because they're just there because they, you know, kissed some you know what on the way up the ladder. <laughs> After World War One, you had the suffrage. Necessary to perhaps not invert the pyramid, but at least rearrange it that you need both incremental progress as well as size. It could well be. I think a lot of people that got behind Bernie uh, during the campaign were hoping that he would be so different. You know, and I mean, I think it was at what people said a change election. People really want something different. Now they've got something different <laughs> and we'll see you know I don't know what's gonna happen but but I do think that I, when I said that about incremental change I didn't mean to say that that's the best I want you know could hope for but I, I think it's probably the most likely uh, uh, rate of progress I hope I'm wrong I hope that there will be some big events or big changes in leadership that will cause people to rethink things. I mean, that does happen. Look at what's happened with gay marriage. 10 years ago, Obama was against it, Hillary was against it, everybody was against it, except presumably most gay people. And now, you know, I mean, and I never could understand the argument. I hope I'm not stepping too hard on people, some people's toes. I never could understand the argument that it's gonna weaken tradition. I would think it would strengthen it by, you know, by having people, who, so some other people want to commit to each other in a presumably lifelong relationship? How is this weakening marriage? But at any event, it has really changed in a very short period of time. I don't know why, I wish I did. <laughs> I'd like to, you know, apply that medicine in some other places. But um, I think, you know, we're always sort of hoping for more radical change, but having to put up with incremental change just because that seems to be the kind of system we live in. But I'm all for, what I'm not for is revolution. And the reason I'm not for revolution is because I think a whole lot of people get killed who didn't volunteer for it in a revolution. And that seems wrong to me. Um, but um, a, a velvet revolution like they had in Czechoslovakia back in the 80s, that I could go for. <laughs> yes? Is there any comparison between the uh, cultural societies like and the societies of which you are? So, I mean, you talk about public spaces. For me, it's different because yes. in my family, my mom, my grandmother is the household's open. 
have you ever seen any research done on that? There was a book that we used to use at Evergreen, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, that, that went into that. And in fact, it argued that the founding fathers actually took some of the ideas that they used in thinking through how to organize the new government from some of the Native American tribes at the time. I can't remember that name of that book. Um, but if you send me an email, I might be able to find, you, find it out. It's camstivers at gmail.com. Uh, but yes, I have read, um, I actually hoped that someday I would be able to write a book about what the United States has done to Indians um, because the administrative state has played a very disastrous role in, in uh, the fate of, of Indian nations. And I probably won't get around to that, but I still read a lot about about Indians and, and, and particularly how the wars during the 19th century just decimated um, Native peoples. So, thank you. Uh, incremental change. Uh, the older you get, the more you see the result of incremental change, I suppose. Uh, there is a project right now that's a follow-up on what William White did in the 1960s in, uh, in the middle part of Manhattan, sort of microscopically looking at social interactions on a particular corner um, oh, yeah. and filming that, just hours and hours and hours of film. Um, well, that was done in the 60s. It's being duplicated now right near Bryant Park and uh, across from the, uh, next to the public library. And so all these graduate students are noting down uh, the difference in interactions and the length of time and all this stuff. And after a while, the biggest change turns out to be the presence of women. That in the 60s, and maybe we took this for granted, those of us who are old enough to have lived through the 60s, you walk down the street, there's just a different social environment on the street of a city in the 60s than there is now and that's marked by the presence of women, the, the, the entrance of women into, into that particular social space. And while I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking about your own work, uh, working with gra grassroots organizations, and that led me to think about Jane Jacobs, yeah. and, yes. and, uh, and a whole generation of women who um, worked through grassroots organizations to create new social spaces. And, and I'm wondering if um, your, your experience in grassroots organizations had um, that kind of gendered, was there in your experience um, a kind of empowerment of women as leaders or, or as voices in civic space? That's a really, really interesting question. And what it makes me realize is, um, yeah, I worked for 10 years for the federally funded community health centers, uh, which are still around. There's still about 500 of them. Uh, they started in the poverty program, and they're in communities where there is a shortage of medical resources, so not enough doctors, not enough hospitals, and so on. And by law, the boards of those organizations have to be a, ma a, a majority of the people on the board have to be users of the services. So um, there are some professional people, uh, but most of them are ordinary folks, you know, who live in the neighborhood and are, are people who are interested in promoting better stuff in their neighborhoods. And, and what, the, what, you, what your question made me realize is that the boards of the organizations that I worked for, as well as the ones that I included when I did my dissertation, because that's what I did my dissertation on, was the community health center program as, a, as a, an expression of active citizenship in the administrative state. What I realized is that by and large, the staffs were run pretty much conventionally. Uh, but the boards were usually majority of women, uh, the boards. And the f feeling I can 
recall of sitting in those meetings and listening to the conversations were was a real feeling of equality between the, the women did not defer to the men the men did not defer to the women they listened to each other and they decided what to do and they got very sophisticated at interpreting all these many directives that came at us from the bureau that was you know giving us the money and how to turn those into some kind of legal program that obeyed all the rules but was our sense or their sense of what the public good was in their communities and um, and that and the leaders the boards were very gender equal I wouldn't say neutral because they didn't pretend that they weren't men and women but they they there was really a feeling of mutual respect Whereas the, you know, the executive directors, almost to a person, were men. Not that they were Simon Legree or anything. They were good guys, most of the ones that I knew and worked for. Uh, but it was a pretty conventional staff structure, you know, with him and then directors of various units and on down the pyramid. Interesting. You made me realize that. <laughs> so what... Um, single fathers actually be lower down, not lower, but be on the same stance as females in the workplace, but they face more stigma because they have to manage taking care of children, which is definitely seen as a feminine priority or job. So it would go against their masculinity and everything they're supposed to stand for. Um, would that hinder them more, or would they be at the same level as women? If you're talking about would it hinder them in the workplace as opposed to just how would they feel about their ability to cope as a single parent, but I, I don't think that there's much, I mean, I don't have any evidence that there's, in fact, my late husband was a single father for a number of years. A previous wife died very young and, and he, he was left with a six-year-old daughter. And one social worker came to the house and started accusing him of child abuse. I mean, you know, for no reason at all. So, but, but I think um, in the workplace, it's very clear that anybody who takes time off to do things for their kids pays a price for it. And that includes men big time. Um, they just don't have to take maternity leave. And, and most of them don't take family leave. Last I read, now that maybe it's changing in the last few years. But because they, when they do, they get back and somebody's doing their work and all of a sudden it doesn't look like the company needs them anymore. So uh, it's a risk for a father to take time off, you know, when a new baby is born. Um, so that's part of that thing I was talking about, that this has to change. Companies and, and public agencies just are gonna have to recognize that this is, this is gonna happen, you know, if we're gonna go on as a human race. So we better just make room for it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you all asked fantastic questions. Nobody wanted to talk about the election. Oh. <laughs> if you have anything on your mind about it, I'd... Okay, it's too soon, I think. I think we're all sort of blitzed. It was such a surprise. I mean, I think even people who voted for Trump were really surprised that he won. So it's just going to take a little processing time. Yes? It's a project for all of us to think about what, what the public good is. Yes. And, and how to, to make civic space and civic space and it's not appropriated by one set of individuals who think that they have the right to say what goes on in civic space. But that's a large project. And that's, that's a project that ranges across the disciplines and really involves the humanities a lot, I think. Yes, and I would add to that that in my own uh, view of it, uh, Americans are practically off the charts on the scale of individualism versus communitarianism. 
We have so much invested in being isolated individuals who um, go out into whatever world there is and compete for resources and and uh, so on and and we're by and large sort of suspicious of communities you know oh that sounds like communism or something that's what people used to say uh, so I think that's that's one shift I'd like to see. I'd like to see a more balanced, uh, uh, you know, understanding of what it means to be a citizen of a of a country. Uh, and obviously, it's both. We want to hang on to our individual rights and so forth, but we also want more connections than those that are in outer space, which is what I'm calling the, you know, where all that twittering and stuff goes on. Uh, those are, you know, those are fine. I, I don't have anything against it except I think it's replacing face-to-face -face communication. And I would so much rather be in this room with you, you know, having a real conversation than, than putting it out in the ether and, and having you send me a comment. <laughs> yes. As a humanities major in my undergrad and now as a MPA program student, All right. I just want to put in a plug. I think um, everything you're talking about is great as far as us being able to visualize women in public spaces and taking up space in public, which are these two different things. Um, but the role that the arts and humanities can play in terms of the actual life of the nature, I think it's really important to acknowledge. Um, I just saw some research the other day that showed a study of little girls that they were shown um, a TV show in which there was a woman pretending to be the president, or a TV show in which there was a woman pretending to be a doctor, right? They were more likely to say, I'm going to be a president when I grow up, or I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. And the role that arts and humanities and representation can play in changing how we feel about women taking up space in the public is really enormous. Absolutely. Supporting the arts and the humanities isn't just money towards frivolous things, it's actually supporting that kind of um, visualization. I couldn't agree more. You know who my hero was when I was in the fourth grade? Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> She had those bracelets that stopped the bullets and she had a golden lasso that she could throw around somebody and they couldn't move all of a sudden. I thought that was totally cool. <laughs> Thank you all so much.